right, welcome to unit four, which is cell communication and the cell cycle. This video is going to cover an introduction to body systems and is also going to cover unit 4.1, which is cell communication. So to get started, let's review how organisms are organized. So if you see in this diagram, we have at the very, very smallest atoms. So that's the chemical level. And those atoms start getting uh, organized into larger uh, units, molecules. So in this case, the example this diagram is using is DNA. And then that DNA, along with many other molecules, um, makes up a cell. In this case, we're seeing a smooth muscle cell. That smooth muscle cell is part of a smooth muscle tissue. And that tissue is part of an organ. And remember that an organ is made up of many tissues, which is made up of many cells, which is made up of many chemicals. Um, and as we keep getting bigger and bigger, we can see sort of how things are all fitting together. So above the organ level, we have the system level. In this case, this is the digestive system. And that's part of our organism. So in this case, um, this young child here is the organism uh, that we're taking a look at. So keeping in mind that we are, all of us, all organisms are made up of itty bitty little pieces, um, how does this relate to the overall topic? Why is cell communication important? Well, one of the reasons cell communication is so important is that if we have all of these itty bitty little parts trying to sort of make one cohesive organism, you have to have communication between all those itty bitty little parts. So let's go on and review all the different organ systems in the body. Um, this is not technically going to be a focus of the AP biology exam, but I feel like if you're learning biology, you really have to know a bit about who you are and what you're made of. So um, I'm going to ask that you learn each system's name, the basic functions of each system, and the major organs of that system. So take a moment now and try to figure out what each of these pictures is representing and start at the top row and work left to right and then do the bottom row left to right. What system is pictured here? So moving left to right on the top row, we have the immune system or lymphatic. Then we have respiratory, digestive, urinary, and then there are two pictures showing the reproductive system. This is showing male and female. And remember that gender and sex, biological sex, are different, and this is a really complicated topic. There's so much nuance. Often in biology classes, especially intro biology classes, we oversimplify things and just talk about male and female. Um, but I want to make sure you understand that that biological sex being male, female is not necessarily um, indicative of gender identity. So we'll talk about that more um, at another time. Down at the bottom row, we have left to right, the integumentary system, which is your skin, hair, nails, then the skeletal system, muscular system, the nervous system, the endocrine system, and the circulatory system. Later in this unit, we'll learn about uh, more detail on the immune system, the uh, nervous system, and the endocrine system. But for now, just know the basics. So this next slide um, just shows all of, the, uh, all of the organ systems and the organs within them and the basic functions. All right, so let's go on to unit 4.1, which is cell communication. So here we have uh, just sort of a, a thought puzzle of thinking about um, how is communication in our bodies between our cells uh, related to communication on a bigger scale. So thinking about communication between people. So here we have a woman who is saying, I thought I had told her to clean up her room. And so if we think about this, this woman who thought she told somebody to clean up her room, uh, what went wrong? Because clearly that room was not clean. So how is cell signaling similar to a conversation and what can go wrong? So right now think about how is communication between people similar to, between, uh, similar to communication between cells? So I like to think of it as there are four separate aspects of communication. There's speaking, hearing, listening, and responding. So what are each of these? 
Well, speaking is like a signal molecule produced by a signaling cell. So it's a cell releasing some sort of information um, and sending that out in one way or another. It hopes that it will be heard. So hearing is equivalent to that signal molecule being received by a target cell's receptor. Now, you may uh, know from personal experience that hearing and listening are not the same thing. So listening is that that message actually creates some sort of change in that target cell. So the receptor transmits a mes message within the target cell. And then the response is that the change uh, that actually happens. So again, listening is that the the message got into the cell and the response is the result of that message getting into the cell. There are many different kinds of chemical signaling from um, cell to cell. Uh, so I want you to look at this diagram and compare and contrast these four types of cell signaling. Try to name each type, um, but focus more on what do you notice, what do you observe from the diagram as differences between them. So the four different types shown in that previous diagram and also shown here, let me get this out of the way. Um, the first one is autocrine. So auto means self. So this is where tar cell targets itself. Um, the next one is signaling across gap junctions. So here is where the cells are physically connected and the signal can move directly from one cell to the next. Paracrine is a cell targeting a nearby cell. So the message moves a short distance um, outside of the cells, but it doesn't go very far. And the following, the last one here is endocrine, where we have a really long distance. So the cell is targeting a distant cell, and this happens through the blood bloodstream. So some examples of each of these. Autocrine um, there is heavily used in the immune system. Um, signaling across gap junctions, an example of this is heart muscle cells in order to coordinate contraction between all the different muscle cells. Uh, this is used gap junctions. Paracrine is where we're traveling just a short distance. Neurotransmitters signaling between neurons in the nervous system is an example. And endocrine is associated with hormones. So hormones traveling in the, um, in the bloodstream and traveling a long distance. All right, so take a look at this diagram and see what you can get out of it. This is a really complicated one, but based on what you already know about cell signaling, what do you see here that is familiar? Focus on what you can observe. So you might have seen all sorts of different things, but one thing you might notice is that this is an example of both autocrine and paracrine signaling. So this cell is sending out a message, and that message is received by other cells that are close by, but also by itself. Um, you may also notice that this purple box with the kind of cutout from it um, are transcription factors. So transcription factors are a way of regulating what genes are transcribed. So what DNA becomes RNA. You might also notice uh, sort of the overall picture here of what's happening is a virus infecting a cell. So the virus is sort of the, um, the initial catalyst of this entire um, response. And so on the left, there's a virus infected cell. And when that cell is infected by a virus, then all of these different signals are starting to happen, um, including some of the immune response that we see here. Um, and so an infected cell can signal to other uninfected cells uh, through the use of the paracrine system. All right. So an important piece of information in signaling is that you can have a single signal molecule that results in a wide variety of responses. So in this diagram, we have a liver cell, we have a skeletal muscle blood vessel, and we have an intestinal blood vessel. So what I want you to take a look at is how are the signals here and the responses similar and different in each of these cases. And then also think about what scenarios might lead to a lack of response completely. All right, so on the left two in the liver cell and the skeletal muscle blood vessel, 
A similarity we see is that the same receptors are shown. So these are beta receptors, um, but there are different intracellular proteins. That's not shown here, but we can have different responses based on what's going on inside the cell. So even if there's the same signal molecule and the same receptor, you can still get different responses because the inside of the cells are different. On the other hand, you could get a difference in response if you compare B and C. Here you have different responses um, because you have different receptors. And so they're both picking up that same signal molecule, epinephrine, but because they are different receptors, that can also lead to a difference of response within the cell. And then thinking about what might result in no response, um, if you think about that idea of communication, why might communication break down? Well, it could break down at any of those four steps. You could have no signal molecule sent, you could have no receptor on the cell, or one of the molecules in the pathway itself within the cell might be disrupted. All right, so we're nearing the end of unit 4.1, and this is one of the most important diagrams, the most important concepts in this unit. So pay real close attention to this. Let's look at these diagrams, and I want you to take a long moment and really think about how is signal molecule 1 different from signal molecule number 2? Okay, so one of the first differences you might have noticed is that signal molecule 1 is shown as quite a bit larger than signal molecule uh, number 2. Um, that difference um, might be why there's a real difference in how those signal molecules behave. So in A, where we have cell surface receptors, signal molecule 1 uh, binds with a cell surface receptor, so signal molecule 1 stays outside of the cell. Whereas in B, here the receptor is inside of the cell, intracellular receptors. So signal molecule type 2 goes into the cell. And if you remember from um, unit 2, the uh, barrier around all of cells is a cell membrane, is that plasma membrane there. And that's also labeled on this diagram. So that means that signal molecule number two had to get inside of that plasma membrane, whereas signal molecule type one did not get inside of that membrane. So why might that be? Why is it that you might have a molecule that doesn't go through and a different kind of molecule that does go through? Think back to unit two and what can pass through that plasma membrane. So signal molecule type 1 cannot pass through the membrane, so it needs to transmit the signal without entering the cell using signal transduction, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Signal molecule type 2, on the other hand, must be both small and nonpolar because we see it passing through the membrane. So if you ever see a picture, a diagram, of a signal molecule passing through a membrane, you need to assume that it is small and nonpolar. So steroids such as estrogen and testosterone are examples of small nonpolar molecules that can pass through. And that is where we will stop for today.